Get on, Ari. There we go. Good morning, everybody. All right. This morning, we're going to talk about Elijah and Elisha as types of Christ. So if you would be turning over to 1 Kings 16, and that's where we're going to start today. And before we start, I've got a, uh, I've got a joke. This one's from uh, Robert Dalton. He told me this joke, so I thought I'd share it with you. So did you know that um, Pharaoh's daughter was the first financier? Pharaoh's daughter was the first financier. And she went down to the bank and withdrew a profit. So you can blame that one on Robert Dalton. So. All right. So Elijah and Elisha as types of Christ. If you'll turn with me to 1 Kings 16 verses 30 and 30 or 30 through 33. 1 Kings 16, 30 through 33 is where we're going to start today. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So Ahab was not a good king. And that's where we're going to start today. And Elijah, the prophet, uh, comes along in verse Kings 17. So if you'll flip over to First Kings 17, we're going to start verses 1 through 7. Uh, as, I, as I start, I've got a few passages to read as we go through the story because it, the way it's written, it, the, the story of Elijah is told so well that I'm not going to try to just, I'm just going to read it the way it is. So, Elijah the Tishabite tells King Ahab that a drought is coming. And so I'm going to read verse, uh, start in verse 17. Now Elijah the Tishabite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to to him, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook of Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And after a while the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. So Israel is in a drought, and it's a natural disaster. Um, And the drought kind of mirrors the spiritual state of Israel. And that's why God brought the drought, because the Israelites and Ahab, uh, what we read earlier in 1 Kings 16, um, were worshiping Baal and not God. So God's word like rain brings brings life, but Israel, and particularly King Ahab, have rejected God's words as their source of life. So following along with that, 1 Kings 17, verse 8, Elijah is going to multiply food to feed the widow. So once the brook dries up, it says, The word of the Lord came to him, Arise and go to Zarephath, which brings to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And as he called to her and said, Bring me a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And he said, As the Lord your God lives, or I'm sorry, and she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. 
And now I am gathering a couple sticks that I may go in the, and, and prepare it for myself and my son that may, we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day of the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And when she went and did as Elijah said, and she, she, he, and her household ate for many days, the jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. So, does anybody see any similarities here uh, between Elijah and feeding this woman and Jesus in his ministry. Yeah, fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Um, And then he did it again. He did it twice, actually. Um, What else? He turned the water to wine at the wedding. All right. So, go ahead. That's a great point. That's a great point. He said that uh, in Acts, and Jesus tells us to to take care of our widows, and that's an extension of the church to do that. And here, Elijah's taking care of this widow and her son. Um, and so that's that's a great point. Thank you. I think it's interesting in this passage where uh, she's telling him that. Uh, basically, all I have is this amount for my last meal for me and my son. She's got this little bitty amount of flour and oil, and that's it. She's about to run out and be out of food. And she says, um, she says, I'm going to go prepare it for myself and my son that we, we may eat it and die. So here, not only is he getting fed, um, but he's basically saving them from the drought and, you know, she has nothing else to eat. So there's some uh, compassion there. There's a reason why she was, that uh, Elijah was sent to this widow. All right. So First Kings 17, 17 through 24, Elijah raises the widow's son. So verse 17, after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms, carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth. So a second ago, we just read about him feeding the widow, and now he's raising the widow's son. Does that remind you of Jesus? She said Lazarus. Yeah. 
Uh, let's look at Luke 7, 11 through 17. If you flip over to Luke chapter 7. In Luke 7, 11, it says, Soon afterward, Jesus went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not go on weeping. And he came up and touched the coffin. And the bearers came to a halt. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has appeared among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout Judea and in all the surrounding region. So Elijah prayed to God, and God heard him and raised this widow's son. And Jesus himself touched the coffin of the widow's son. And so you've got the story of the widow and her son falling ill in Kings. And then all the way in Luke, you've got Jesus uh, touching the coffin and raising the widow's son in Luke. So that's pretty neat. Pretty amazing. And what a connection between the widow's son. Any other comments on that? Okay. Right. So he said, uh, for those that can't hear at home, he, he said that the widow should have been convinced when he performed the miracle uh, of the flour and the oil. Uh, but then uh, she doesn't say uh, what she says until after her son is raised from the dead. And I, you know, I don't know if she was just proclaiming it again or if she really wasn't sure uh, what was going on during the first miracle, but then she's 100% positive when her son is raised from the dead. Um, so thank you. Yes. Yeah. But there was some level of love and compassion that he is putting himself in the situation and essentially wailing to God for some compassion. Um, that really speaks to me too of Christ in the later part of his life where he was acting for <coughs> God in a lot of ways for people to see, for them to be forgiven, even if they're the ones doing it. Yeah. I just think it's a really cool story to kind of see the personalities being similar to, not just the actions. Yeah. And Elijah's there because he's fleeing. He, he tells King Ahab this drought is going to come uh, to the land and he knows he's going to be blamed for it. They like to blame people for their problems even though they were the ones uh, worshiping idols. Um, and that's why Elijah has to go out and stay away because he's the one that told him this, uh, this drought was going to come. And so he's staying with this widow and... You know, when you're a visitor in somebody's house, you kind of feel responsible to help take care of them, especially when something like this happens. Uh, so, you know, I, 
I see a lot in my job. I see people uh, when some when you know a death of a loved one happens or things like that. People tend to blame things on other things. They don't want to really see the truth of, of what may have caused it. They they want to look around and find things. And, uh, so it's good that she realized that this was from God. So let's turn over to First Kings eighteen. So it says the drought had lasted three years before God sent Elijah back to Ahab. So that tells us Ahab was, was uh, staying away for three years. In 1 Kings 18, 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have. And your father's house, because you, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So it's interesting here, like I was talking about, Ahab immediately, is when he sees Elijah, says, Is it you, O troubler of Israel? Like Elijah is the one that brought this. Uh, curse upon the land and it wasn't Elijah wasn't the reason this curse was brought on the land it was because they were uh, worshipping Baal but they don't want to admit that so it's about being honest uh, with yourself So now uh, Elijah sets up this showdown. Uh, he confronts King Ahab and begins to set up the showdown. Elijah tells them to place a bull on the altar and put no fire to it, and he will do the same. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it, called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon. So several hours they're calling on, upon Baal. O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar, that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is God. Either he is musing, or he, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out, of, out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of oblation. But there was no voice no one answered. No one paid attention. So here we have them making fool of themselves, trying to dance around this altar and try to try to uh, have Baal answer them. And of course, we know Baal doesn't exist. Baal is not a real god. And so Elijah's mocking them. And you know, can you imagine him just sitting back for hours watching them dance around, cut themselves? holler, make a fool out of themselves. So then Elijah put the bull on the altar and had them soak it with water twice. So I like that part. So to make it even harder, he soaks it with water. And I don't know if any of you guys like camping or anything, but if you ever tried to light wet wood on fire, it's not easy. So he soaks it with water. Verse 36, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their face and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So God brought down fire and proved to the people uh, who the one and only true God is. It's a pretty amazing story. It's, it would be neat to be there to witness that. So does this passage remind you of Jesus in any way? Any way? Any connection? All right. 
So I, I kind of struggled to make one specifically on this story myself. Uh, but what kind of I thought about was when Jesus died on the cross, God did a couple things. He did a few things, but God brought darkness from noon until 3 p.m. and also an earthquake. And so God will control nature uh, to get our attention. And in this case, he brings fire down from the heavens and consumes this uh, altar. And so, I mean, can you imagine in this time, just being in this time and seeing that, it would be just like a nuclear explosion. I mean, just blow your mind uh, to stand there and see this. And same thing, you know, when Jesus dies on the cross, uh, just to see darkness in the middle of the day uh, for three hours, uh, how frightening that might be in an earthquake. And then God sends rain. So once this uh, altar, and once it's proven who the real true God is, and they, they embarrass the prophets of Baal, and then God finally brings rain after three and a half years. So turn over to 1 Kings 19. So it's here in 1 Kings 19 that we seem to come to the ultimate purpose of Elijah. So if that wasn't enough, he's really here to prepare the way for the next generation of God's servants who will utterly destroy the house of Ahab. Uh, Haziel is to be appointed king of Aram, Jehu as king of Israel, and Elisha as the prophetic successor to Elijah. But before that, Elijah must flee the wrath of Jezebel. So when Jezebel found out about her prophets of Baal being slaughtered, she was very angry and planned to kill Elijah. So here we see him fleeing the, the scene again. So it says in, in 1 Kings 19 verse 4, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. So I think it's interesting. He flees Jezebel and goes out a day's journey and lays down to rest. And then we see him uh, being fed again by God. So God feeds him because he knows he's about to go on this journey. And it, it specifically says 40 days and 40 nights. So I think that's really interesting, the tie-in there. You know, we see that that's the same tie-in as the flood. And Moses stayed on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights when he received uh, the Ten Commandments. And Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the desert before he was tempted, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. And also, Jesus lived on the earth 40 days after his resurrection. So are you seeing all the connections here from the Old and New Testament? I don't really know what the significance of the 40 days is in all these different passages, but I think it's pretty neat how they're all interconnected. And if it wasn't, if it wasn't for us to see, it wouldn't say specifically 40 days and 40 nights. So I think that's pretty amazing. Any thoughts on that? All right, so Elijah was lodging in a cave. He's still out in the wilderness. And God asked, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah was very bummed uh, about the whole situation. Uh, Israel had forsaken God, thrown down his altars, killed his prophets, and only Elijah was left. So God woke him up out of that bummer attitude by this in verse 11. 
And he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah again responds with the sob story about being the only one left. He's really bummed about what had happened. He went and this amazing thing happened with the fire that came down and proved that that uh, God was the one true God and still it didn't quite solve the issue and Elijah's hiding out in a cave uh, and in verse 15 God reveals part 2 of the plan verse 15 and the Lord said to him go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus and when you arrive you shall anoint Hazael to be king over, over Syria and Jehu the son of Nemish you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the, the son of Shaphat, and Abel Meloah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave seven thousand in Israel, all the knees, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So finally. You know, he's out there, he's in this cave, and God comes through and he shows him the, this wind that comes through like a hurricane and splits the rocks. And then he shows him uh, an earthquake and fire. But to, until God whispers to him and comforts him and tells him, you know, this is, the, this is what's here for you, this is the plan for you, Elijah, this is what how the story is going to end for you. And so it gives him, it gives him a, a journey and, and uh, his next uh, thing that he should be doing. And so when I studied that, I kind of thought this reminds me of how we need to be, you know, when we're kind of down in the dumps and we're, we're bummed out about life or things uh, have really happened to us that we don't appreciate uh, or we're sad about. We need to always be looking forward, and even when we feel alone and distraught about what has, what has happened, God may not be done with us, and just like in this case, God was not done with Elijah. So Elijah then goes to meet Elisha and confront Ahab at Naboth's vineyard. So when Elijah meets Elisha, what was Elisha doing? And we're going to read that here in 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19, 19 through 21. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of, of Saphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and mother and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back, for what have I done to you? And he returned from, the fo from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes and gave it to the people and they ate. And then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. So here we have Elijah meeting Elisha for the first time. Elijah takes his cloak and puts it on Elisha. And so this cloak... You know, that it first mentions the cloak when he's in the cave. He puts on the cloak and he goes out uh, and hears the whisper of God. And now he's taken that same cloak and he's put it on Elisha. And Elisha stops what he's doing, runs after him, and says, hey, do you mind if I go back and say goodbye to my parents? So he takes his oxen back, he cooks them up, feeds the people, says goodbye, and leaves. So Elijah didn't waste any time. He went back to say goodbye to his parents. Uh, and much like the disciples in the New Testament, Elijah basically stopped his life, whatever was happening, and he took off in service to God. Uh, 
All right, 2 Kings 2, we're going to read about Elijah's death. 2 Kings 2, verse 7. As they were standing by the Jordan, then Elijah took his cloak. Here we have the cloak again. Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to one side and the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. I mean, that, it's crazy how... I read that, and I'm just like, how nonchalant is this verse? You know, we know about Moses parting the Red Sea and the Israelites escaping from Pharaoh on dry ground. And here we have Elijah and Elisha just walking along. And he, you know, just parts the waters of the Jordan and they walk across. So verse 9, when they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. So if Elisha sees Elijah being taken, then he will receive a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. Verse 11, as they... As they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. So Elijah ascended to heaven, much like like Jesus would 40 days after his resurrection. That's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, we know of two people, Enoch and Elijah, that, that were brought up to heaven uh, who hadn't died. It's interesting that Elisha here uh, says, My father, my father, his chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Remember that, because that'll come back again. So also, uh, you'll read a lot about Elijah as a type of John the Baptist. So if you would turn with me to Luke 1, 13 through 17. I kind of changed gears a little bit. But over in Luke 1, 13 through 17, the angel of Gabriel speaks to Zechariah and tells him that his wife will bear a son named John. And who is he referring to there? John the Baptist. So in verse 15, for he will be a great, or he will be great before the Lord, in verse 17, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. So right there in the New Testament, there's Elijah being mentioned in reference to John the Baptist. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So it's, it's interesting there that, you know, Elijah and John the Baptist have that thing in common. They're both kind of preparing the way for somebody else. So Elijah is preparing the way for Elisha. And John the Baptist is preparing the way for Jesus. So you see a t- a Elijah being a type of Christ, but you also see him being a type of John the Baptist. In both Mark 1.6, uh, both Mark 1.6 and Matthew 3, 4 identify John the Baptist as wearing camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locust and wild honey, which is the same description of clothing given to Elijah in 2 Kings 1 8. In 2 Kings 1 8, they answered him, He was a hairy man with a leather girl bound about his loins, and he said, It is Elijah the Tishabite. So even they even wear the same type of clothing. And it's mentioned there. So Elijah's most famous exploits, uh, what we talked about, is his calling of a drought upon the land of Israel and his defeat of the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. And while there are hundreds of prophets slain in this passage, it's often forgotten that this is not the end for Ahab, Jezebel, or even the prophets or idols. In fact, the very next chapter, you see Elijah 
uh, running from Jezebel and hiding in the wilderness and begging for death. So it's not really, it's not really the picture we would expect from a victorious prophet of God. Uh, but we know that Elijah had a very special purpose and a very special spirit, and he was special to God, so much so that he was taken up to heaven alive, just like Jesus was. So there are any other connections to Jesus that I may not have mentioned. Right. Absolutely. You know, Elisha stopped what he was doing, plowing the fields, and ran and said goodbye to his folks and then hit the road immediately. You know, he didn't say, oh, I need to go sell my oxen and take care of this and that. He, he went and said goodbye. He cooked up the oxen because, obviously, he doesn't want them to go to waste. He can't just leave them out in the field. That would be kind of cruel. Um, but stops what he's doing, says goodbye, and, and hits the road, just like the, uh, just like uh, Jesus with the um, disciples. What else? Yeah. Don't ask me a hard question, Shane. I may not know. I don't know. Uh, I mean, when you just nonchalantly walk across the Jordan River on dry ground, I mean, I'd want that plus some. So, I don't know. She, she asked why, um, if you didn't hear, she asked why do you think Elisha asked for two portions of Elijah's spirit? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so back then, the, uh, uh, yeah, if you, did everybody hear that? For those of you at home, he, he said that uh, back then, uh, people, they wanted a double inheritance. They wanted uh, their inheritance plus some from uh, their parents. Or, Right. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right. So next week I'm going to finish up with Elisha and then we're going to start Isaiah. So I appreciate your time, everybody.